Uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, as, as Steve mentioned, I'm a neurologist. I'm a sports neurologist. Uh, when I started the American Academy of Neurology Sports Neurology section about eight years ago, there were five of us in the first meeting. Uh, we now have over 500 members of that section. And, and Coach Carr, I mean, now that he's an independent neurologist, i got to get him signed up and get him the union card. And uh, that's great to hear that he's going to be taking on that role because we could certainly use the help. Uh, so I've been asked to speak about um, a topic that could take a long time, sideline evaluation, injury management. So I'm going to cover a lot of things uh, in a short period of time, just a little survey of some of the more major uh, issues uh, that I've uncovered and dealt with over the years. Um, you know, the first thing uh, is, well, just the topics I want to cover, I want to talk about things to keep in mind about concussion itself, the injury, some of the things that make it unique and different from our other sports medicine injuries. Uh, we'll talk about the importance of knowing your sport and the environment that you're dealing with and understanding that there are differences from sport to sport and how you should do evaluations and things you should be aware of. Um, also, it's important to know that people are taken care of and understand that everybody's different, uh, not just in the concussion they experience, but how they uh, were put together when they went into that concussion in the first place, a, a very important part of taking care of these injuries. Uh, the concussion diagnosis itself we'll talk about, and then we'll talk about injury management uh, and return to play. Uh, so the first thing I want to mention, and I think uh, uh, Dr. Guskowitz pointed this out earlier, is you know the term concussion is used, and, we, and that's sort of the focus of all of these meetings. This is a concussion summit, right? There are concussion meetings, and concussion this, concussion that. Uh, but the term is actually used, I think, almost more inappropriately than it's used appropriately uh, when talking about uh, the injury itself and what it means to our patients. Uh, whenever I think about concussion, I kind of expand the whole topic uh, into really three different time frames, three different uh, sort of levels of injury, if you will. Uh, the first being the concussion itself, that transient physiological state uh, that is induced by biomechanical force. Uh, there may be some cellular changes as well going on, but for the most part, that clinical syndrome is a short clinical syndrome. It's several days, a couple of weeks, uh, sometimes several weeks at most. Um, Post-concussion syndrome is a different thing. And if you went right now and looked and Googled post-concussion syndrome and tried to find definitions, you're going to get a bunch of different definitions. Um, I like to really think of it as something that doesn't have a distinct time frame. It's not like four weeks and then post-concussion syndrome starts or three months. That's not the way the brain works, right? Really, I think of it as just what it says, right? The concussion is over and there is a syndrome of symptoms that remain. It's not post-hit long concussion syndrome, in other words, right? It is a distinct entity, um, very uh, complex, multifactorial uh, entity that needs to be looked at in that fashion, not as a long concussion. But that, you know, is usually several weeks, months, or years on, on time frame. Um, and then finally, the third uh, would be the, the chronic effects of concussions, or as Dr. Guskowitz mentioned, subconcussive blows, or just getting your, you know, uh, your brain exposure uh, uh, to impact over time. And, you know, as a neurologist, I want to stress that every patient that we see, um, every patient you see in the sidelines or in your clinic or even in your own kids, the concussion is important, absolutely, but it's an opportunity to step back and look at the bigger picture and realize that what we, un what we do as far as our management, what we do as far as understanding and risk going forward must take all three of these things into account. Um, and that's really the way that um, I think any concussion talk needs to be um, uh, grounded in this concept. Uh, there are also three uh, quick axioms um, that I consider very, very important when dealing with these injuries. Uh, the first is that not every injury to the brain causes a clinical syndrome, right? Um, un unfortunately, I could do an MRI in this room, and I'm going to find small tumors and MS plaques and little strokes that you guys didn't know you had. Uh, brains are actually pretty decent at continuing to function uh, when there's a certain amount of injury. Right? They're wired to do that in many ways, especially when the injury is not a focal process like a stroke, but a more diffuse process like a concussion. So why would we ever think that every time somebody's injured, they're going to produce a clinical effect? Right? And that's one of the problems with concussion research and looking at epidemiology numbers and doing engineering research and using concussion as the clinical outcome. And I'll talk about that in a little more detail in a moment. Not every brain symptom or clinical sign following exposure to biomechanical force is due to concussion. That's, that's sort of where we are right now. Um, and, and I think it's okay to assume that if somebody takes a hit and they have a neurological symptom that it's concussion, but you can't stop thinking about it, and you have to actually figure out whether it is or not eventually. So remember, there's a difference between, uh, while you know, it's important to get the diagnosis right, it's more important how you manage the patient. And not every hit with a symptom 
uh, that, that follows it means there's concussion. You have to actually keep thinking. And then finally, uh, the clinical syndrome of concussion itself may be present, uh, and there may be symptoms that are uh, concurrent with that injury that are not due to the concussion. Uh, and again, it's a, it's, a, it's a concept of you can be very simple about this and oversimplify things, but you're going to miss a large part of the clinical value um, of how patients are presenting, and you're not going to do that, uh, that person uh, justice. Uh, this is a slide that, that um, I use a lot, and it kind of summarizes those three points, I think. Um, you can consider you know, force applied to brain or, or you know, brain experiencing several small forces over, over a short period of time leading to a clinical syndrome of concussion is sort of the simple model that, that people like to think about. The reality is, um, you know, neurological constructs tell us, and this is not, this is how the brain works, uh, that you really have two different processes going on. You have to have the force experienced by the brain to cause the injury, to cause the physiological state of, of a neural network dysfunction and some of the symptoms that go along with it. But then in each individual, you have to have enough injury to cause that syndrome, right? Because there are really two thresholds that we have to talk about, the injury threshold and the symptom threshold. Uh, a simple way to look at it is when I'm on the sidelines of a Michigan football game or um, a, a ski race or whatever, and somebody takes a hit that I witness, um, and we evaluate them, and they produce no symptoms, no findings, no signs, um, and, they, and they don't going forward. You know, we evaluate them every 20 minutes for the first hour, at halftime, after the game, the next day, the next day after that, the whole week. They never develop a single clinical effect. I cannot look them in the eye and say, you were not injured, Right? Um, at the same time, people who come off the field after a hit and have that clinical syndrome, that's, that's a little easier. So I ask you, which one is, is a better situation? Having a patient that, whose brain is wired in, 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 a, in a way um, that every time they have a little bit of injury, they are producing a clinical effect, or the opposite of that, right? So those that come into my clinic, for example, I had a patient yesterday, um, I, I think it was yesterday, uh, it's been a long week, but um, sometime this week, uh, who had many concussions in their, you know, five or whatever concussions during their, their sports career, high school kid. Um, and, and so that sounds like a lot, right? That sounds like, oh my gosh, the concussion burden must be huge. Well, this is a patient who has migraine history and a family history of migraine headaches and ADHD. Um, and these are things that we need to take into account. Does it mean that they are injured more often or that their brain is better at producing symptoms? And that's kind of the problem I have with, with making simple statements about concussion incidence in our epidemiology studies or concussion risk in, in engineering studies, uh, when what we need to understand is the concussion that we are seeing clinically is not the injury itself, it's the brain's projection of that injury. And everybody's got a different setting for what it takes to project an injury and what that injury looks like when it's projected, right? So it's partly what makes um, my job challenging, but also a lot of, a lot of fun at times. Um, and so with that as a beginning, I want to just point out, again, sort of the know your environment scenario to this. You know, sports concussion um, um, is talked about most often as, as something that occurs, you know, in a variety of sports, but people don't really stop and think about what that means from the clinician standpoint, from the athletic trainer standpoint, the physician standpoint, what the differences are in each sport as far as being able to recognize injuries during the play, being able to manage them on the sidelines. Environments are different, and, and I think one of the things I'd love to see us do uh, in the sports concussion world is begin to not only just understand that, but develop that concept. Um, that the things that apply uh, to the D1 college football sidelines are not what are going to apply to, um, you know, youth soccer, just as far as resources go, and as far as awareness and education and everything else you can think about, even just following the play, being able to take care of patients, all those things are different. So I would love us to be able to start to have the conversations in a sports-specific level. Uh, just an example of, of this is the hottest game from last year. This is about as good as it gets in the sideline. I was in, in, in the front row. Um, but even then, you can imagine if you're a physician or an athletic trainer, um, if one of your players is injured on the far side of that play, uh, it's hard to see. So in football, you see the evolution of well, now we have spotters. At University of Michigan, we've had spotters. This is now we're going, this is our first full season of having one of our own spotters in the booth. And it's been a, an incredible benefit. Uh, to have somebody in the booth who can just see the play, review the play, tell us in our, in our ears like what happened, uh, it's, it's an incredible benefit. Do we need spotters for every sport? Well, no, because not every sport has the same um, you know, visual uh, uh, needs, the same number of participants. Uh, this is a shot from, from a ringside um, thing that I did last year where, yeah, no, I mean, the, the problem here isn't seeing the thing. The problem here is getting to the patient. If anybody's ever tried to like 
jump through a, a, a boxing thing. Uh, the first time I did it, um, it didn't go so well. And uh, <laughs> uh, it was a little embarrassing. But, um, but those are things you have to think about, right? And, and you can't just go, you know, be a clinician or go into the environment and not understand the challenges you're going to have. Um, you know, this is the top of the snowboard, um, uh, snow cross uh, race at, in, at Sochi. Um, so in this scenario, yeah, you have to know, well, how, how are you going to get to these people, right? Here's a, here's a map of the course where we have to understand, um, I guess I don't have a point here really, um, uh, you know, wh where are the access points? Where can we get into the course? How do we get people out of the course? All these things are extremely important. Um, in taking care of athletes. And so to have one concussion policy that covers all these things, even, even in the Winter Olympics, you know, uh, you know, we're talking about ski events, every event is different, has a different set of challenges. And I think that's an incredibly important thing to keep in mind uh, when, you're, when you're taking care of athletes in the sidelines. Um, the next point I want to make uh, about this is when you are covering a team, when you are responsible for, for the health of individuals, um, I think it is it, really a requirement to understand that that team is as, as well as possible. This is an example of the lanyard that our fellows use over at Eastern Michigan University. And I'll blow this up for you. Um, we have on the lanyard, I've, I've blocked out the names there on the right. Uh, player position, their name, their, um, I'm sorry, player number, their name is blocked out, position. The next number is uh, a research number that we have uh, for one of the neurocognitive tasks that we use. The next number is the score on our version of, of our sort of sideline evaluation test called the MSAC. Uh, and next to that, we have history, right? Um, things like sickle cell trait. Uh, this person was spacey the day after a game in <laughs> September of 2015. You would think we're being a little, you know, overly dramatic about this stuff, but it actually really, really helps uh, when you have this kind of information available to you on the sideline of a game, in the locker room at halftime. Uh, we also have examination points on uh, the next column over. I promise we do. Um, Things like, you know what, they, they, their single leg stance that we test was good, but it was a little poor. Um, you know, this person had eight to 10 beats of nystagmus uh, to the left, two to the right on, on baseline exam. These are some really important information to have when you're trying to make these diagnoses. Now, this is D1 football level, right? Is this something that, you know, I expect people who are covering, you know, youth soccer to be able to do? No. Um, but that sort of illustrates my point, is that our environments are different, our situations are different. We have to know our strengths, use our tools, um, and manage these patients uh, most effectively. Um, so with, with that in mind, I mean, really, uh, when you're on the sideline of an event or covering any kind of uh, sporting event at all, um, you know, really, when it comes to concussion and brain trauma, you have two decisions, two things you're looking for. The one, the most important one, is an emergent injury, uh, something that will require uh, immediate medical attention. Uh, these are most often skull fractures, internal bleeding, intracranial bleeding, those types of things. Um, and in that regard, I mean, what sports do you think have the highest risk of those types of injuries? Well, it's not the helmeted sports, right? It's sports where people are still moving around fast and maybe not using helmets as much. Um, you know, so, you know, uh, there are probably a lot more fractures in soccer than there are uh, in football, I'm sure. Um, keep these things in mind as, as you're, you know, going, going out to events and covering things. For the next, the, the next, um, Decision, you know, if you have a person in front of you who's down, you may or may not have witnessed this, this incident. Um, you know what, is there an emergent in injury is the first thing. And the second thing is, there, is there a concussion or not? So let's get into that a little bit. So the emergency part of it, um, I mean, obviously there are some very basic CPR level things that we look for. Um, the ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation, uh, always take precedent over what we do in the field of play. Um, but if you are in a situation where you're taking care of athletes and need to know how to evaluate somebody for a C-spine injury, right, and, and take the, the right precautions for that, the um, NATA has recently changed, for example, in football, the recommendations on how we handle C-spine injuries on the field. Um, and so things are always changing about, about that particular part of the examination. Um, if you have a seizure in an athlete after a brain trauma, after, after a, a hit um, of significance, you know, seizures typically, they don't really I would say the vast majority of seizures in those settings don't mean an emergent thing. Um, but I kind of have this feeling when I, when I see a seizure after a hit that this person should definitely have some additional evaluation um, in the emergency facility uh, in, an, in an urgent manner. Uh, level of consciousness is extremely important, right? Um, you know, basically, after a, if somebody is concussed, level of consciousness can kind of go in two directions. They can actually become hyper aware and be a little... Uh, almost a little manic at times, but they can start, they can start being a little sleepy or being a little groggy, being a little out of it. That's one thing. But if they are starting to fall asleep in front of you and it's hard to get them to stay awake, 
Uh, that's a situation where they need emerging evaluation. And if there's a focal presence or a focal presentation to, to what they're doing, in other words, you know, half their body's not moving, uh, facial droop, some kind of typical stroke sign, these are things that would get uh, people to the ER. So if that's not the case, um, let's talk about concussion itself. And um, you know, there are a lot of ways to, to look at concussion signs and symptoms and categorize them. This is just one uh, from a table um, from a paper I did with Dr. Giza back in December of 2014. Uh, nothing magic to this grouping. Uh, but essentially, I, it is important, I think, to think about where these symptoms are coming from. Right on the far left, we have the cognitive mental status uh, symptoms of inattention, slowed thinking, amnesia, those types of things, uh, versus some of the physical uh, symptoms of headache, nausea, vomiting, I'm sorry, headache, nausea, dizziness, and, and, and the like. Uh, the affective um, or the mood-related symptoms uh, and maybe some sleep issues. What's important to understand is that um, when there are symptoms of concussion, both the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system are actually producing symptoms, right? I mean, the things on the left, the mental status cognitive part of it, that those are all cognitive functions of the brain, that is central nervous system brain injury. But a lot of the physical symptoms, the headache symptoms themselves, come from the peripheral nervous system being activated by that injury. And guess what? That peripheral nervous system can be activated by other stuff too, especially if you have migraine headaches, right? So it's, it's not enough really to just um, have a list, have a checklist, and this is what you do. You need to think about where these things are coming from when you're doing your evaluations. So that brings me to the SCAT form. This is the SCAT 3. Most of you are familiar with this, the Sport Concussion Assessment Tool. Um, I was honored to be one of the individuals that helped put together this version of it. Um, and I would say that this is a, a great tool for organizing an evaluation. Um, it should not be the only part of your evaluation. And what I'm seeing time and time again in the sports medicine world, in the primary care world, um, and in the neurology world too, is that people think that this is all they need to do. This has become the neurological history and evaluation of a concussed person, uh, and nothing could be further from the truth. And I would actually say that a lot of the things that we, the, a lot of the ways that parts of this tool are used are actually detrimental to performing good clinical care. And just for a couple of a quick points, um, this is not meant to be a sideline tool. It's used as a sideline tool all the time. Right? But there's a, there's a portion of it here called the sideline assessment, um, which is you know, a series of simple go, no go questions. If these things are present, you know, you're out of the game or you're out of participation for a day. Um, but that doesn't mean that you sit there and you, dog, you just go through this whole form on the sideline and if they score what they did, um, you know, they're, 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 what they did in the baseline, they're not concussed. That's an inappropriate use of this tool. Um, there are some fantastic parts of the tool. Uh, the, the cognitive evaluation, uh, the SAC, which was uh, written by two of our speakers uh, today. You had, some, you had some collaborators, right? Just you two? Just you two. Oh, Jim, I'm sorry. Dr. Kelly, of course. Um, uh, that's something that, that is used, I think, in a lot of different situations, um, not just in this SCAT form, but it's a mental status approach to orientation and memory and those types of things. But what about the symptom checklist? Something that has been studied and researched and said, oh, yeah, this is a very sensitive measure for concussion. It is a god-awful way to do a history, right? To give somebody a checklist and say, how do you feel with these symptoms? Um, I tell you, if that's, the, if, that, if that's what you're using for neurological history, you're missing 90% of the information. And you're not, you're not allowing yourself to interpret what those things mean, right? So the SCAT is a great form to use, and I think it's something that is important for people to have an awareness of and understand that it can be used from one situation to the next over time in a useful manner. But I really want to stress that if you want to perform a comprehensive neurological evaluation that is diagnosing and managing brain injury in anybody, let alone athletes, uh, that this should be a starting point and not the only thing that you do. Uh, and so what, you know, so what kind of things should you do? And I don't have enough time to get into all this stuff, but you know, basically a, a concussion examination um, you know, is, takes on different, different parts to it. It's not just about doing a mental status exam, which is a big part of it, for sure. Um, the cranial nerves uh, are, are quite frequently affected in concussion, especially eye movements. So there's a lot of buzz around now about some eye movement tests that can help diagnose concussion. Um, and there are other tools, too, for, for balance. Uh, the best, for example, and other tools that, that have been developed to help people uh, perform a neurological examination, uh, to help them bring information into their decision-making process. These tools are not decision-making tools themselves and should never be used that way. But yet again, they, they are, time and time again. 
people, you know, they scored this on their best, they scored this on their impact or this on their King Debit test, and that means yes or no something about concussion. No, it doesn't. Um, it is an examination point, and that information has to be brought in and dealt with uh, by a person making a medical decision, okay? Um, the other thing I want to talk about briefly is this, this concept, um, and a lot, those of us who have been doing concussion research and, and taking care of patients uh, for years have, have acknowledged this, but I think we're trying to get this to be more of a common discussion, um, especially in the media, if, if possible, and it's a difficult one to have with them because, again, you know, uh, me media has, has a role to play. They have a job to do, and they didn't go to medical school. They didn't go to athletic training school. It's our job to help them describe these things a little bit more accurately. But the truth is, since I don't have a diagnostic test for concussion, right, I don't have that, that, that thing you can pee on, and yes, you're, you're, con you're concussed or whatever, um, you know, when we give that diagnosis to somebody, whether you admit it or not, you are assigning them uh, a, a degree of certainty, right? Uh, there are cases where you witness a big hit and there's loss of consciousness followed by an ataxic syndrome and disorientation and there's no other explanation for that presentation. That's a definite concussion, right? We can call that a definite concussion. There are situations, though, where you may have seen a hit um, and the symptoms aren't quite as, as distinct. They do uh, cross over into things that could possibly be other explanations. But you know what? The mechanism was clear. Um, and even though I have other things under differential diagnosis, you know, dehydration, maybe a heat effect, maybe some neck issues or what have you, the concussion is still the most likely explanation for this clinical syndrome in front of me. That's a probable concussion, right? The flip side of that is if you have somebody, maybe the mechanism wasn't so clear. It's after a practice and they have a headache. Um, or the mechanism, it wasn't a big hit, but there's something else going on. And they have migraine and ADHD and other things in their life. And you think, yep, concussion's on the list, but it's not the most likely. I would still call that a possible concussion. And the, the truth is to this that, you know, once you begin this conversation uh, in your own mind, putting together your clinical formulation, and you start talking to your patients uh, in this manner, what you realize is that the benefit of time and serial evaluation will help clarify this tremendously, right? Somebody who uh, during a game um, has a syndrome that you're worried about, um, and you pull them from the game, you don't let them participate. But if you stop and call them concussion right there and then and never go to the next step and actually perform a comprehensive neurologic evaluation and put together differential diagnosis, um, I mean, you, you're potentially, you know, assigning an injury to this person that they didn't have, right? The next day they show up, for example, and let's say, yeah, they had no symptoms furthermore and they had a neck strain that was obvious or there was some other explanation um, that makes that concussion far, far less likely. That's one scenario. The other scenario is uh, that night they slept poorly and they wake up in the morning with a headache and they wake up in the morning feeling worse. Uh, now you've moved the other direction. So maybe you've started with probable and gone to definite or you've gone from probable to possible or possible to none. The point is it's a, it's a diagnosis in evolution, right? And, and the time that we spend with our patients will help us uh, determine where they are in these categories. Now another point I'd like to make is, is you know, the vast majority of our research, as a matter of fact, I can't think of a, well, maybe a couple papers that have been published, have taken these things into account. What you hear is, you know, concussion diagnosis was given by whatever, whoever, whatever person was there, the athletic trainer, the physician, or what have you. But there's no discussion about how certain were they. And so our concussion research, to me, I, I look at it and it's just a sea of, like, you know, heterogeneous injuries that, that, you know, depending on the training of the person, depending on the past medical history of the person, depending on, uh, whether they were diagnosed with concussion before or not is going to affect how they're being labeled um, after a hit, right? Um, this concept that one concussion makes it easier to, be, you know, easier to be concussed again, I have to fight all the time because what's definitely true is one concussion makes it a lot easier to be diagnosed with concussion again because the clinicians tend to stop thinking. And they say, oh, you had that concussion in, in back last spring and you, now you have a headache, so concussion number two, sorry, right? And that's, that's not good enough. And, and that just, it isn't. Um, talking about clinical dynamics a little bit, uh, this is sort of a, a very uh, kind of common concept that you have a force applied to a brain early on, um, you're going to have maximal, uh, you know, some injury of some sort. Uh, but what I like to think of is having a, you know, dotted white line here that represents the clinical threshold. Uh, and as clinicians, our job is not to know when the patient is feeling better, but to know when the injury is over, right? That, that's, that's really one of the, the most complicated things um, that we have to deal with and one of the most important roles that we play. Uh, we understand that, you know, it, it, this is an injury of uh, physiology, 
of energy utility. And if we continue to stress the brain, if we continue to stress that person, um, that you can prolong the injury uh, curve. Um, this has been shown in animal models and a little bit in human models, but that's one of the essence of, of why we tell people to rest up front because we don't want to make the injury worse. But sometimes, you know, our presentations actually take a little time to develop. It may get worse on day two. Now, this white dotted line, the tricky thing here is this is not a static line. This thing changes in people all the time. It's going to change from person to person for sure, right? But also within that person from day to day, from hour to hour, depending on a lot of different things. And so we have to be very vigilant about that concept that what we're looking at, the clinical syndrome in front of us, again, is the, pres is the projection of the injury, not the injury itself. So what can we do as clinicians uh, to help get to when is the injury over? Well, in essence, um, that is why uh, we start with this kind of concept um, of, all right, so you're you know, diagnosed with concussion. I want you to take it easy. You know, I want you to rest. I want you to rest physically. I want you to rest mentally. Um, I want you to eat well, hydrate, and get some sleep. That's, that's sort of our acronym for step one of how to manage concussion. Uh, pretty straightforward. But what is rest? You know, what, what is mental rest? Well, I, from my perspective, it's putting somebody in, in a medically induced coma. Um, but, uh, you know, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about relative rest. We're talking about reducing the amount of cognitive exertion that they're, that they're under, undergoing, not, you know, completely um, eliminating it. Uh, and same thing with physical rest, right? I mean, you're always doing something, even if you're sleeping, there's some, something going on. But um, you want to take those things um, carefully and be careful not to sort of overrest people, which brings me to this concept. Uh, this is also from the same paper published back in December. This idea that, you know, once diagnosed with concussion, I want you to do nothing until you feel like you're back to yourself um, will work. Uh, it will work because it's the nature of a lot of these injuries will, will just resolve over time on their own. But the problem is that there is a, a subset of people, and I think that subset is actually growing, uh, interestingly, and I think it's probably because of some of the media coverage and just awareness and anxiety and psychology about concussion. There's a subset that is growing that if you take them and say, well, don't do anything until you feel better, their symptoms will just keep going. Um, and actually, that same subset of people would have problems if I just told them to do nothing even if they weren't injured. I just took them out of school, took them out of life, took them out of athletics and said, don't do anything for two weeks, three weeks. Come back and see me and tell me how you feel, right? A lot of people are going to start having energy problems, sleep problems. Uh, people prone to headaches will get headaches. So the very thing that we tell people to do with concussion, I want you to rest, uh, we have to understand is potentially going to cause symptoms in individuals. That may take a few days, may take a few weeks. But that is something that we have to deal with. So our approach now is to say, yep, there's a period where I want you to rest acutely. I want you to do not much. That will coincide, uh, thankfully, with the same period where they don't want to do much anyway, which is they just feel so awful. They just really just want to lay down and not do anything. Um, we call that the acute rest phase, where you're actively avoiding daily stuff. Right? That doesn't have to be very long. That can be a day or two or two or three, maybe four or five at the most in some cases. Um, you know, but the idea is there will be a time where you want to have them start um, doing things, physical and cognitive things. Uh, and that goes into the second phase of rest, the relative rest phase, where you're not have, having them do their full activity, but it's relatively less. Understanding when to turn that switch on um, is one of the arts of managing concussion and something that, that uh, I think takes a lot of experience to do. Um, and so, you know, I think that's, that's one of the challenges we have is getting uh, the information and the experience to all the providers out there so they can start making these types of decisions. Now, once people have started doing a little bit of stationary bike workout and a little bit of cognitive stuff and they can go through a regular life, a day of life, without, you know, feeling significantly worse, then you may be able to go on to the third phase, which is the graduated exertion phase. So this is the thing that has been published a lot and talked about a lot and is in a lot of policies all over the country. Um, about how to manage concussion is well, once you feel like, you know, once you're without symptoms, start this graduated exertion. Um, and that is something that I've, I've seen uh, can be extremely um, problematic when people take a formulaic approach to it. Uh, a lot of times people say, okay, um, concussion, and then six days later, feel like yourself. So now start the process. Here's the process step one, two, three, four, five. Every day, do this. And it becomes a one way track, and five days later, they're playing. Um, the reality is that uh, this schema, and this is just our version of it again, sort of you know, stationary bike, uh, then some more aggressive cardiovascular exercise, then some level of agility, then some level of cognitive exposure, and then no restrictions. Each of those steps is not designed to make sure they can play sports again. 
um, it's to make sure that they're not injured by driving that white line down, right? So that if there is an injury there, we're going to produce symptoms before we put them back in a, in a risky scenario. So you have to, as a clinician, try and decide how much time does that person need to develop symptoms with each of these challenges. And I'll tell you that it's different from person to person, and it's different from age group to age group and situation to situation. Again, so a formulaic approach, a protocol approach to return to play, um, while I think it's necessary from a policy standpoint uh, and from a legal standpoint, um, perhaps it's something that if you're talking about it from a medical standpoint, uh, you need to have some room uh, to make some decisions and guide the process. Uh, one example of that is sort of the, the agility level, right? So the agility level of this process is meant to expose the brain to complex movements, reaction time scenarios, um, complex physical tasks, you know? And I think that really will depend from sport to sport on how um, detailed that agility step needs to be. Uh, in football, for example, the difference between running a football drill and running a football play uh, is significant, but it's a lot less than running a hockey drill and playing in a hockey game because of the constant flow of visual information that hockey provides and the speed and the number of objects that people have to use to make a decision. In football, it's line up, I know the play, I've got to react a couple things, six seconds later, it's done. In hockey, it's a 45 second shift of constant cognitive bombardment, right? And so understanding that the agility part of that needs to work up into that, that, that cognitive in red phase and understanding sport to sport, again, it's gonna be different. Uh, here's just one example of some of the things that we do in our clinic to help this concept out. This is an NHL player who um, was having problems with visual spatial tracking and those kinds of things after, um, after a concussion. And, you know, but we put them in different environments. What you see is somebody who is, we have a, a ping pong robot that shoots balls, about 100 balls per minute, um, almost two per second. Um, the good, good news is hockey players are, are very good at this, and actually ping pong is an, is an NHL um, uh, concept. They use, every locker room has it, and a lot, a lot of guys play it actually competitively. Um, but we turn the machine up different speeds, we put different spins, we have them do cognitive tasks, counting the orange balls, not hitting the white balls, we change the floor, what he's standing on to you know, challenge balance. Um, so you, you take apart all of the things that you're looking for. I wanted to know in this situation, for example, were his symptoms because of eye tracking or more of a vestibular thing, and if you alter this environment, you start to tease out those scenarios, right? And, and so that, that's the kind of thinking that you have to have. You can't just say, oh, on day four, do, you know, 10 minutes of this exercise. Um, everybody's gonna be different. You have to have really creative ways to try and tease out these things, especially in elite athletes when they're uh, so highly trained, and it, it takes a lot to really stress them. So real quick about post-concussion syndrome, um, I just want to touch on this briefly. Um, you know, it's something that, like I said, it's not a long concussion. Uh, and it's important to know that because it's a very different management. Um, it can be hard to recognize sometimes, but you will see, you know, in, uh, injury curves or, or even symptom curves, I guess it's symptom curves, that should be. Somebody is, is improving over time and then that improvement goes away and, and they um, uh, start getting worse. Um, and depending on where that symptom threshold line is, you can tell it can be kind of a complex scenario. But in general, the best thing to do is to look at timing um, uh, of the symptoms themselves. If there's a traditional concussion plateau of recover or curve of recovery that then plateaus without any other reason for it to plateau, you should ask yourself, well, what's going on? Is something else here? Is this a sleep effect? Is this a mood effect? Is this I'm not playing sports, right? So there's, again, there's no sense of like three weeks, four weeks. It's got to be a... Um, a clinical decision that's made on the fly like that. But when you have somebody with post-concussion syndrome, you need to look at all the factors that, that go into that. Like I said, there are many factors. Every case I've dealt with has had more than one factor. Uh, very, very common is what I refer to as the unplugged syndrome, which is the idea I talked about. If you're not doing anything, that's going to affect how you feel. Different psychologies will produce symptoms when people try and come back, and so you need to understand that. But whether you have a, a migraine headache disorder that's been unearthed or an ADHD scenario that has been decompensated or even sleep apnea. I mean, sleep apnea actually is something that's, that's not commonly diagnosed after concussion. Why is that? This is a great hint to, to what the nature of this injury is, right? It's not because the concussion caused airway constriction or, or the size of their tonsils to increase. It took a brain that was sleep deprived because they always had a sleep apnea. Um, and therefore, it was working at, at a disadvantage. The networks were disadvantaged. And it put a network injury on top of that and decompensated. Now they have problems. Now they can't focus at school. And now they, you know, so that's, that's the kind of nature of, of the situation. But you have to peel back each layer.
And the last thing I'll say is, is this approach to post-concussion syndrome I found to be very useful, is to try to identify what I call the lodestone concept in people. So the thing that is in the middle of their clinical syndrome uh, that's kind of driving the ship. There may be a couple of things, but usually there's one thing. Um, it's the anxiety disorder, it's the bad migraine disorder, it's the ADHD. That's the thing that if you don't treat that eventually, they're not going to get 100% better. But that's different than what I would consider the keystone thing, which is the part of their history uh, that is most easily addressed and treatable to help unravel the whole process. That might be helping them with sleep or headaches or some other aspect of their presentation. Um, and then you have to identify each of these factors and you become like an Australian shepherd. You're, you're like keeping the sheep going forward. All of them have to go together uh, to, to have a successful treatment course. Um, this slide is here, and I'm not gonna, I don't have time to get into this, um, but I wanted to at least mention it uh, briefly. And this is sort of my schema on thinking about medication approaches in these injuries. Um, on the left, again, I kind of break it down into different time frames within 24 hours, a typical concussion, meaning seven to 10 days or so, a longer concussion for some of the reasons I may have mentioned, or post-concussion syndrome, and headache, sleep, mood, and attention are things that we can treat. Right? This idea that we don't have any treatment for concussion drives me crazy. Um, we have treatment for the symptoms for sure, right? So in 24 hours, do you want to treat the headache? Probably not. Maybe Tylenol if it's bad enough, but I really want that person just to kind of develop their headache and see what happens. But at day two, day three, am I going to let them suffer for a week? Well, no, I'm going to use some naproxen or anti-inflammatory um, to help treat their headache, right? I want them to be off of that when I start making return to play decisions, but why am I going to let them suffer? Same thing with sleep, right? Would a little melatonin help them day two, day three? Uh, after their concussion thing diagnosed. Sometimes it would. Uh, mood problems, usually don't treat those right away in the first 24 hours anyway. Uh, but later on, if somebody's got a post-concussion syndrome, for example, um, you know, why would I not treat them with an antidepressant? If their migraines are bad, why would I not treat them with an anti-migraine medication? Um, and so just, I wanted to put that out there sort of just an organizational schema. There's not an answer. There's not like one medication I would use in each of these scenarios. There's a whole lecture basically in each one of those boxes. Um, but that's kind of the approach that you have to have uh, dealing with these patients. So key points, uh, just to summarize, uh, getting the diagnosis right is important, right? Are you concussed or not? Is this definite, probable, or, or possible concussion? But what's more important is how you manage the patient, right? So um, that, that, that's the key to this. And I think that's what's lost in a lot of the conversation we have. It seems like people assume that if we just had enough resources on the sideline that we could diagnose concussion every time accurately, and that's not true. What's true is we should be able to manage those patients the um, best way possible so that uh, we're not letting them play unsafely. But if it takes a day or two to get that diagnosis right, it takes a day or two. And we need to, we need to realize that's okay. Um, these are complex medical decisions. These are not things that should be taken lightly, uh, things that can be put into a checkbox scenario, a symptom checklist scenario, or a simple physical task or a tool, right? These, these are things that need to be considered in, in, in a complex neurological fashion. And like I said, tools only gather information. They don't diagnose things. Um, and that should be number five. Actually, maybe it's number one because it is the most important thing. Um, really, we're talking about athlete brain health, our patient's brain health, not concussion. To me, you know, concussion is a, is a problem I need to diagnose, but it's almost an opportunity. It's an opportunity to look at that person's past medical history, their previous exposure to sports, what they plan on doing going forward, looking at their family history of, of neurodegenerative diseases, and get a sense of, all right, you know what, if you're going to play competitive football, I want to see you every year. You know, the idea that, that somebody who plays a contact or a collision sport, um, it's not a requirement to have a neurological evaluation once a year. We need to change that because that's how you start monitoring for change over time. That's how you can look your mom of, of your patient in the eye and say, you know what, I, I think, you know, not, it probably wouldn't be a good idea for your son to play football in college. You know, just based on the number of concussions, you're completely missing the point. Um, so that, that's the level that we need to get to, and I'm, I'm happy to have had the opportunity to talk. Steve, thank you so much.